My name is Nancy Roberts. I'm an economics professor at Arizona State University. We've been discussing supply and what we know is that supply is based on profits. Producers are interested in profits. And so when we began our discussion of supply, we said to find supply we have to find profits. To find profits, you obviously have to compare revenues with costs, and you can't understand costs unless you understand a bit of production theory. So we began our discussion with production theory, then we talked about costs. Today what I want to do is talk about revenues, because when we compare revenues with costs we can see profits and we're nearly there. However, when we come to a discussion of revenues, we basically have to identify the industry structure. Some industries are very, very competitive. There's lots of firms producing the same or very similar things. So there's supply and pricing decisions. In other words, how much output will I produce? What price will I charge? Those decisions are very different than if you produce in an industry where you're the only one who makes this particular product, or you might have a tiny bit of competition, not very much, so your pricing and output decisions will be different. So when we start talking about revenue curves, we have to identify the industry structure because revenue curves look different depending on the industry structure. Output is produced basically on a continuum from monopoly Two, down on this end of the spectrum, we have a structure we call perfect competition. Now, this is a continuum. A monopoly is an industry where there's a single seller of a product for which there are no close substitutes. You could think of, in, here in Arizona, APS, the electric utility, supplies electricity. They have no competition. I know there are other electric utilities, but you don't get a choice. You, the utility you are assigned to depends on where you live. So we would call APS a monopoly. And as we move from this end of the sp spectrum, monopoly, we have an industry which we call an oligopoly, where there are a few very large firms who do compete with one another but they're very large and um, their pricing decisions are um, varied and not as certain as we understand monopoly and perfect competition and other industries. We'll discuss oligopoly a little bit. We get into the, uh, a topic called game theory when we talk about oligopoly. Moving further down the continuum, we get to an industry structure that we call monopolistic competition. Monopolistic competition is where the bulk of economic activity takes place in the US. Most of what happens in the US happens under this industry structure. What, what it means is monopolistic competition means that there's a lot of small producers and the products are slightly differentiated. But there's a lot of competition, and en entry into the industry is relatively easy, and the products are different. For example, a Big Mac, a Whopper, a Wendy's, a Carl's Jr. Western Bacon Burger, even tacos. That's like, you know, a hamburger and a shell. So uh, we're getting more and more competition as we move this way. Down at this end of the spectrum is something we call perfect competition. And the best example we have in America of perfect competition is agriculture. And so we'll use the U.S. agriculture industry as an example of perfect competition. Now, for an industry to be perfectly competitive, there are four criteria that must be met. Number one, there must be lots of buyers and sellers. Now, we could argue over what, what how many is lot a lot of buyers and sellers. Enough, however many it takes, so that no single buyer 
in a perfectly competitive market, nor any single seller in a perfectly competitive market has control over the price. So you could think of a situation, I mean, cotton, there's a lot of cotton grown in Arizona. Um, and the cotton farmer grows the cotton, he picks it, he puts it into gigantic bales, and then he sells it. And he sells it to a cotton gin. A cotton gin is a big factory where they pull out the cotton seeds and the cotton seed oil and then sell the raw cotton and separately sell cotton seeds and cotton seed oil. So the gin is the buyer, the farmer is the seller. If in fact we have lots and lots and lots of cotton farmers but only one gin in the area, the cotton farmers went to sell their cotton, well we have a market because we have a buyer and we have sellers, but in this market, the buyer, the cotton gin, would have some control over the price because he's the only one that's going to buy, so these guys have to sell it to him at the price he's asking. So he would have some control over the price. That's not perfect competition. We could turn it around the other way and say, oh, well, we've got one big farmer, he's got 50,000 acres of cotton, and we have six or seven cotton gins but just to the one farmer. Well, the cotton gins need to buy this cotton so they can make some profit. But they've only got one seller to deal with. So in this case, the seller would have control over the price. That's not perfect competition. We have to have enough buyers and sellers so that nobody can control the price. If we think about agriculture, let's just think about wheat, for example. Um, how many wheat farmers are there in the U.S.? Thousands. How many people eat wheat. Millions. So we have lots of buyers and sellers. Um, so we meet that criteria in agriculture. The second criteria, criteria is the product has to be homogeneous. Homogeneous. That means you cannot tell Farmer Brown's wheat from Farmer Smith's wheat, from Farmer Jones's wheat. A bushel of wheat is a bushel of wheat is a bushel of wheat. The product is identical. Not all markets are that way. I mean, a minute ago we talked about a Big Mac and a Whopper and Wendy's and Car those are different. You know, Wendy's has a square patty and McDonald's has this special sauce and sesame seeds. So they're different. Not so with a bushel of wheat. So the product is homogeneous. The third criteria, textbooks often call it perfect knowledge. I think that's a bit heroic, but perfect knowledge, L-E-D-G-E, -E, perfect knowledge. What we mean by perfect knowledge is that the, the cotton farmers, they, they don't even have the cotton seeds in the ground yet, but they know who's going to buy their cotton and they know what price they're going to get per pound for their cotton. Already the cotton seeds aren't even in the ground. Furthermore, in a perfectly competitive market, the cotton gins know whose cotton they're going to buy and what price they're going to pay for it, and the cotton's not even in the ground yet. Uh, so that's what we mean by perfect knowledge. The last criteria is in fact the most important. This is the one that drives the competitive model. This is the one that makes this model work, and it's called mobility of resources. Mobility of resources. It's also called freedom of entry and exit. So I want to put that down here as well. Mobility of resources means freedom of entry and exit. So what we mean by that is if you're a wheat farmer, and you own a tractor, and you have some land, you can be a wheat farmer. But you don't have to be a wheat farmer. If you've been a wheat farmer for years, you say, I'm tired of this. I want out of wheat farming. Well, leave. You don't have to be a wheat farmer. If you want to be a wheat farmer, you've never been a wheat farmer, go be a wheat farmer. You have the freedom to enter and exit an industry that is perfectly competitive. In other words, when we say mobility of resources, your resources, what belongs to you, this is where this notion of 
um, well-defined property rights comes in, but you own your own labor. You, you, you own, if this tractor is yours, it's yours. You can do with it what you want. So you have the freedom to enter and exit. You can take your resources and move them where you want. Um, you say, well, of course, this is America. We have the freedom to do anything we want. No, we don't. You, you can't just hang out a shingle on your house and say, brain surgery, come on in. You can't just enter an industry. You can't just build a nuclear power plant in your backyard and sell nuclear power. You, APS can't say, I'm sick of this. I don't, I'm tired of people complaining. I quit. We're out. You can't do that. So there, there are a lot of rules and regulations that even guarantee a lot of monopolistically competitive industries. If you want to open a restaurant, a small hot dog stand, there are certain rules and regs you have to meet. Farming, perfectly competitive, enter, exit, it's good. So these criteria define a perfectly competitive industry. Okay, we've just finished an overview of uh, industry structures and I've focused on perfect competition. What I want to do in our next video is explain re what revenues look like for a firm that's in a perfectly competitive industry so we can compare his revenues with his costs and see his profits and therefore we can identify his supply curve. So in the next video that's what we will do.